Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about five tips to start your very first taxonomy browse project. Now, I have other videos, I will link them down below in the description about how to make taxonomies, what are some tips and tricks. These are five additional that I wanted to express because these are the ones that I hear the most often that, you know, you are so uh, hung up on how do you make a taxonomy? How do I get the terminology? What do I do with it? That by the time you finally have your taxonomy in place, these are the five questions I get the most once you're at that stage. So I hope these help you. And if this is interesting, keep on watching. And we use the same language with our customers and our end users. Now, this might also be internal stakeholders. If you are only dealing with internal folks when you're dealing with taxonomies and even knowledge graphs and search engines. But for those of you that are working on e-commerce or you're doing something with data governance where you have to have external stakeholders looking at what you're doing, or you're dealing with search applications or other things that have end users that don't actually work or are employees of your company, you just have to be very conscious of the way that you are describing and, and labeling these things in your interfaces and in your documentation. So there is uh, one organization that I know of that had three levels of uh, depth to their taxonomy. It was a taxonomy. They were not calling it that. They were calling it their categorization cluster. There were no clusters. It wasn't really categorizing anything. It was a straight up taxonomy. They just didn't call it that. And what they did was each of those levels came from different vocabularies that were no different than any each other. They were just varying degrees of specificity. Again, if you were looking at it as a straight up taxonomy, it would just be broader, narrower kind of relationships. But what they did was they took the internal jargon that was labeled for each of these types of vocabularies and they used it externally. So uh, when I was starting to work with their data and I was trying to describe to them, you know, how can you improve some of your data? It was really difficult to even communicate um, with a consultant, me, because they, they really had so much tied up into the language of, I'm gonna do it over here. So they had classification, subject headings, and categories. Now, first of all, if I was just listening to that, I would put categories and then subject headings. Also, you will very rarely hear me talk about things called subject headings on this channel because it is a very old school way of talking about things and headings are things that most people understand as H1, H2, H3 type of markup in documents. They don't really understand that it is a subject tag. Most people are more familiar with what a tag is because you can do it on Twitter, you can do it on Facebook, you can do it in everyday life. So I tend to use tag or term when I'm talking about these kinds of things. All right, you don't have to do that, but that's the trick that I have learned. All right, so if you're looking at those uh, different levels, what I would suggest to you is to step, take a step back, have a, a, a heart to heart with the others that are working on your knowledge model. In this case, it's a taxonomy and ask everyone to just come up with one term to describe this, or you come up with a term and let everyone else call it what they will internally and just on the user interface or in your communication to the end user, come up with one simplified term for the thing you're talking about. That's tip number one. Tip number two is when you are looking at your hierarchy, I get another common question and that is, how deep is too deep? And again, we get into this issue where internally, we you know, maybe need a very high level of detail and so we have very many levels deep. Um, and then we have people often that also say, well, I don't really want something that, that, that is that deep, so I'm just going to have a lot of broad coverage. And that also kind of has the same issue. So you can have way too many categories 
and not a lot of depth in each one of them, or you could have just a few categories and very high depth. Now, there are a few issues that you get into in both of those situations. So when you have too many broad categories, what that means with not a lot of depth, what that means is you are most likely not really clustering them effectively. Now, if you are doing document tagging or asset tagging um, for internal systems, that might be okay. But if you're using your taxonomy for a browse function, you really wanna be careful doing this because if there are too many options on the screen or it's just too difficult to understand the full catalog of assets that you have, you're not going to have as many click throughs. You're not going to have as much value in what you're offering to your users. So be careful doing that. Now you can have the other problem, which is you don't have that many categories and they're very deep. People still don't have a high attention span. If they are doing a browse, that dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, and dig it's, they're gonna lose patience and they're gonna just do a regular search, find whatever they need and just walk away. The other thing that you will find is people uh, internally when they are tagging things with that structure or even when they're adding new terms to that vocabulary, things are so interconnected at such a deep level, sometimes they can't find if there is a near duplicate of the term that they are trying to add to the vocabulary, or they don't know what the see also's and use for's are going to look like because things are so deep, deep, deep into, into the hierarchy that they can't really find it. So what you often see is uh, what's called circular reasoning, where you don't necessarily realize that one term is related to another term is related to another term. And so you're basically saying one thing is related to another thing that's related to its original thing. It's not a good, it's not a good look, especially if you're using this in machine learning. You don't want circular rationale. It just makes the computer very confused. So you also want to avoid that. Another common question I get with indexing uh, specifically is how many tags is too many tags. Now we are going to have a special guest uh, this month that is going to talk to us a lot more about the best practices. But I will say from a pure asset perspective that is more on the document side, uh, you want to shoot for between three to 10 tags. So three is usually the happy um, medium, but once you get out over 10, it's kind of like you're oversaturating. So the trick here is if you were trying to describe what this article or this book or this document is about essentially. So essentialism is a type of indexing where you are looking at what is the core of what this thing is about because um, oftentimes indexers also try to just pull out the special words. That's what a search engine's for. You don't have to worry about that. The, the subjects and the search engine should not be competing. They should be complementing one another. So what that means is the search engine is going to pick up on the really specific subjects and, and authors and other types of very unique terminology that shows up in a document. So you as the indexer, human, doing tagging, shouldn't have to worry about that. Now, there are exceptions to this if you know something is often confused or it's something that's highly valuable. There are reasons that you might want to use those as tags as well. I'm not saying don't ever do it. But net on, on net, uh, your search engine should be picking up on those very unique things. What you do with the tags is, what is this essentially about? Something that might not even show up in uh, the subject tags and in the subjects within the article itself. In my last video, up above, where we were talking about how do you extract the natural language from different uh, prompts, Quite a few of those were words that didn't actually show up in the text. That is what you really want to focus on. What is that human understanding that the machine is not going to pick up on uh, if you're using a, a, just a regular keyword search in, in your search engine? And also when you are looking at your terminology, you are going to find terms that may look the same as far as a string, but they mean different things. Java is the example I usually use. Java is a country, but it is also 
the thing I drink in the morning. So the way to do that is not to shove all of that context into the label because the label should first of all be a unique ID so you could swap out the labels when you need to, UID information up here. Um, but what you do wanna do is let the hierarchy speak for you, right? So if you do a browse feature and you are looking at things in Indonesia and Java shows up underneath that as a child, that adds to the context. So you don't have to shove it all into Java dash dash island or Java the island or other weird things that some people do. Um, same goes for Java coffee. If you are somebody that has an art gallery and it's online uh, where you sell certain paintings and there's a lot of them out there and it's really difficult to find artwork um, portraying certain things because there's just so much art out there. But if you were looking for something that was made with Java, like maybe coffee stains on a, on a canvas or depicting Java, those are two different contexts of the same concept. So think about how you can use your taxonomy to help someone drill into that. So maybe one is art medium, meaning coffee was used as the actual medium to paint versus I want an image of coffee because I own a coffee shop and I want some art for inside my coffee shop. So that is a good tip not to shove it all into the label because it's, it's going to still be very difficult for people to drill down and find it. And if they already have to drill down to find it anyways, why do you need to put it all into the, the label? They've already kind of drilled into the context by that point. So all you're doing is you're hurting yourself with machine learning and search issues when you shove it all into the label. So just try to avoid that if possible. All right, and the last thing that I want to impart to you in this video is when you are trying to decide what your taxonomy should look like and how to describe it to an end user, look at the other templates that are out there in your industry. So if you know of competitors or sister societies or other businesses similar to yours, look at how they're describing their taxonomy and look at how they are structuring those things. You should not duplicate it exactly. That's not what I'm saying. But those are already familiar to your end user. So if you can quickly tie into something that's already familiar to your end user, your stuff is still unique. You are still putting, you know, special sauce into whatever you're doing. So basically just make sure that if there is a familiar flow already out there that you study it and get some inspiration from it. Don't copy it because you don't want to just redo what somebody else has already done. But typically we all are, are working in similar interfaces and we kind of have a feel for how to use things. So if you can emulate that in the interface that you have, especially with your taxonomy and your browse features, that's just going to make it more intuitive for your end user. All right, so I hope you enjoyed those five tips on starting your first browse taxonomy project, or if you already have a project started, maybe you can go in and see how you can refine it. These are things that I hear very often out in the industry. So if you do come across these, don't feel bad about it. Everybody else is dealing with the same things. So those are the top five that I hear the most often. What are the different questions that you hear in projects like this? Leave them in the comments below. And with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.